Good evening. We're going to sing some songs of praise and worship as we always do before we start our services. We're going to sing, Oh, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Sing it with us this evening. Oh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the army of the Lord. As we march along, we sing our song of the one who set us free. And we use God's word as a two-edged sword against the enemy Emmanuel we're marching in your name Emmanuel the lamb that was slain Emmanuel has risen again Emmanuel Emmanuel Oh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the army of the Lord. As we march along, we sing our song of the one who set us free. And we use God's word as a two-edged sword against the enemy. Emmanuel, we're marching in your name. slain. Emmanuel has risen again. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, Emmanuel is Lord. We're going to sing it through one more time. The gates of hell, oh the gates of hell shall not prevail against the army of the Lord. As we march along, we sing our song of the one who set us free. And we use God's word as a two-edged sword against the enemy. Emmanuel, we're marching in your name. Emmanuel, the lamb that was slain. Emmanuel. Let's slow it down this evening and sing that song. My chains are gone. I've been set free. And after this song, let's take a moment to praise God together to worship Him. My chains are gone. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was grace T'was grace that taught my heart to and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour i first believed my chains are gone my chains are gone i've been set free my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised, the Lord has promised good to me. He will my shield and portion be as 
as long as life endures. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon, the earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. You are forever. You are forever mine. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. Set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Let's praise God. Father, I love and I glorify you and I magnify you this night. I magnify and praise the name of Jesus Christ, my God, my King, my Savior, the Lord of all. She amando solo corrimande, viando solo corriba, she odoso. We're just going to take a moment to pray this evening and ask God's blessing on the service and this time together. Let's believe God. Father, we pray for your blessing upon the word of God. We pray for your blessing upon the Hornsby Church. Lord, we contend for breakthrough in our lives personally. We contend for breakthrough in our city, Lord God. We pray for revival, Lord God. Revive us, revive our city, revive our land, our nation. God, have your hand upon our fellowship churches. Have your hand upon, Lord, the cities of this nation, Lord God, that people would come to you. We pray your blessing upon your word this evening. Speak to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome out again this evening to the Potter's House Church Hornsby's online service. Just want to let you know that we have uh, service again on Wednesday evening. And what we'll be doing is an online uh, Christian or kitchen table Christians uh, meeting together and looking at Paul's portrait of Jesus Christ. And I found last week's study encouraging just to see all your faces and also to go through the word of God and the picture that Paul paints of Jesus Christ and how that helped him to be a Christian. I believe it will help you as well. That's this Wednesday at seven o'clock. Details will be available on, on our website. Website. Also, just a reminder for the men, there's a men's discipleship with Pastor Walsh this, uh, tomorrow evening uh, via Pot uh, Parramatta Potter's House live stream. It's at 7.30. I encourage you to tune in. Also, we have morning prayer throughout the week. I'm here at 7 o'clock. Come and join us in that time and believe God for your life. Those are all the announcements. I'm just going to take an offering this evening. just want to encourage you to continue to give. And so this evening we have our online church details, online banking details rather, uh, that you can give into the kingdom of God. I encourage you to give generously, allow God to bless your life and continue to support the work of God. God's going to bless you as you do that. And uh, let's just pray and ask God's blessing on the offering. Father God, we thank you that we can give into your kingdom, that we can be part of what you're doing in the earth today. Bless the gift and the giver this evening, Lord God. Bless your people and bless the church, Lord God, that we might do the work of God effectively, that our giving, Lord God, would release your will in the earth, Lord God. We pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, it's good to be with you. And this evening, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2 in just a moment. We're going to read there together from verses 4 to 10. Uh, I was, uh, heard a story recently about a, a dentist. His name is William Dorfman. He's a dentist in Hollywood, uh, and he's a dentist to the stars. He uh, fixes many movie stars' teeth, and he obviously does a great job because they all look fantastic. Uh, but he also works for free in a clinic in downtown L.A. where he fixes the teeth of homeless women, prostitutes, and abused women and children. 
And he says he finds it greatly rewarding and that one of the benefits of his work is to see the change he sees in these women's lives after their teeth are fixed. He says uh, they become like a new person. She sees herself and she sees a new person. He does a work in them and his dental work brings out a confidence in their lives and they become like new people. How much more the work of, uh, that God does in your life, in my life as Christians, as born again believers, how much more should that make you and I new people this evening and give us a confidence in our lives? I want to preach about God at work. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 4 to 10 together. Let's read the word of God. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God at work. I want to talk to you first of all about the idea that God has worked for us. You know, some people have the wrong idea about God's love. They think somehow that God's love is conditional, that God somehow in a fit of, I don't know what, decided to love you, decided to love me, fell in love with us, saw something charming or beautiful or wonderful and says, you know, I'm going to love that person. And we think uh, after that, that if we want God to continue to love us, we're going to have to do good. If we do good, God will love us. But if we do bad, God will not love us anymore. Whatever it was that prompted him to love us in the first place will stop. And this produces people who are driven to perform, who are working constantly like a rat in a treadmill, round and around and around, just exuding effort just to gain God's love. But they're not working out of love. They're working out of a fear that God will stop loving them, that God will be unhappy with them. And the issue with this is that people that do this or live this way are never confident about their salvation. And if you play that out, if you continue down that line, you, people can end up being bitter or regretful that they served God. They can begin to come to a place where they're afraid to ask God for help because they feel inadequate. They feel like they're not worthy. They're like the one talent servant who says of the master, you're a severe and demanding boss, wanting what you did not work for. And, uh, and, and, and he sees the master this way. And as a result, he feels there's nothing I can do to please this guy. That no matter what I do, I'm going to fall short. It's never going to be enough. Uh, and maybe this evening, you've been guilty of seeing God that way. The reality is God's love is unconditional. There is nothing you can do to earn it. And it's not a result of anything we've done. But it's a result of what God has done for us. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. God paid the ransom to buy your life back from sin and death. This is not something that you earn. This is something that God did. A ransom is something that is paid to free a slave or a captive. It's a payment made to liberate a life. Jesus paid the price to liberate us from sin and misery and hell. And verse 10 of our text says, we are his workmanship. Your life, your potential is a result of God's work in your life. God is the architect. God is the creator. He is the builder of our existence. He is the artist of the universe. The things that astound scientists and philosophers about our lives, about our planet, about our universe. All God. God has done all that. That is who he is. That is what he does. We are God's workmanship. God has done a work for us. 
the word workmanship, the Greek word is the word poemia, and it's the English word that we get the English word poem from. A poem is an expression of the soul. Uh, but our text implies much more than a poem. We are God's workmanship. We are literally God's work of art. You are God's workmanship. And uh, the reality is that God saw you as a great artistic work. But sin stole you away. So he died on the cross to steal you back. No poet has ever died for a poem, but God died for you. We're beautiful to God. Isn't that amazing? Our lives, despite our faults and our shortcomings and our failures, we are beautiful to God. We are treasured by God. It says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 17, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. That's an amazing scripture. It says that we are God's jewels. Thinking about this, have you ever seen a, a young woman who's gotten engaged with a big old engagement ring? Have you ever seen her come into the building for the first time or come into you know, your workplace and she's been engaged and it's like a, you know, just a very subtle kind of a, a look there. It's like, a, oh, this old thing, this old engagement ring. I mean, it's her pride and joy, that piece of jewellery. And it brings her such joy. God says we're his jewels, that we're special to him. We bring pleasure to God. And that's amazing. Not by what we do, but by who we are. He created us and he looks upon us. And he says, that, I'm pleased with that. I value that. And if you're doubting the value of what God did when he created you, the value of the creation is linked to the one who created it. Think about this. The most expensive work of art ever sold was a Da Vinci painting. It sold for $430 million in 2017. $430 million for a painting. The most valuable piece of art is also a Da Vinci painting, the Mona Lisa. Some say it's worth $830 million. Others say it is beyond value. But the paintings would never exist without a painter. It's the fact that they're linked to the painter that makes them so valuable. We are God's work of art. We are God's create, creation. We are treasured by God. We have great value because God values us. We are a work of love. And as a result, we are valued and we're protected. And the point of all this this evening is that as a practical aspect, uh, and God, and it's this, and it's that God has done this so that you could enter rest. Think about the Jewish law. Jewish law was based on what you did. And the reality is that no matter how much you did, the, you could be doing more. The idea is, is that no matter how much good you've done, it probably wasn't quite enough if you could do more. And so you could imagine the pressure and the weight that would add to your life and the sense of like, no matter what I do, it's never enough. And uh, that's why it says in Hebrews 4 verse 10, For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. God wants to bring you rest this evening. And, uh, you know, the reality is a lot of times we think that we've got to work to earn God's favor. We've got to earn uh, somehow work to earn God's love and, and that God's love for you is somehow conditional. That's not the case. So he he's done this. He's done this work in you because he values you. He wants to give you rest. And he's also done this to give you confidence. There's a story uh, in 2016, the son of a Russian import tycoon decided to get married. And his father spent $1.3 billion on the marriage. The bride's dress was jewel encrusted. They had a fleet of Bentleys and Rolls Royces to escort the guests to the venue. The venue was filled with exquisite, uh, expensive furniture. Walls of flowers from around the world were shipped in. The finest silk tablecloths were flown in. 
All the gifts that attended were given a jewel-encrusted box as a thank you gift for coming. They ate a 10-course meal. The warm-up entertainment for the evening was Sting, followed by a full performance by Jennifer Lopez. This guy spent $1.3 billion on his son's wedding, and I say that to ask the question, do you think that couple's ever going to worry about how they're going to pay the bills? If their father spent $1.3 billion just on their wedding day, I don't think they're going to be worried about where their next meal is coming from. The reality is this evening, God has lavished his love upon you. When he saved us, uh, he gave everything. Do you think it's impossible or do you think it's possible for him to somehow run out of grace toward you? Verse 4 and 5 of our text. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. God's grace is not something you can work towards. It's something that God has already done. There's a second thought this evening, and that is that God is at work in us. It's not just a work he's done for us. Uh, he's at work in us. The Sistine Chapel is famous for a, se a series of fresco paintings on its massive roof, painted by Michelangelo over six years in the 1500s. It's a massive work. It's considered a masterpiece. But hundreds of years of candle smoke and damp atmosphere and pollution have affected the painting. And it turned what was once, a, you know, this masterpiece into a dark and shadowy looking series of images. It was still amazing and stunning and uh, people marveled at it. But in the 1990s, they undertook a massive cleaning operation using the latest technology to very carefully strip away the, the, the centuries of grime and dirt and pollution and restore the painting to its former glory. You know, this evening God sees you as a masterpiece, but once he purchases us back, he wants to restore us to his in initial or intended glory for our lives. And he does this by transforming us from our old state to a new state. And just like those paintings on the Sistine Chapel, over the years we can accumulate a lot of dirt and grime, bad attitudes and sinful habits and different things in our lives before salvation, but even after salvation, Christians over the long haul. And as they cleaned these paintings, they found that one of the problems was that bad cleaning efforts from the 1700s had actually damaged the paintings, had done more harm than good. They'd attempted to apply a layer of varnish that Michelangelo never intended for those paintings to have. You know, a lot of our efforts to improve ourselves can do more harm than good. When we think that, you know, we don't need God's help to improve ourselves, it can do more harm than good. And especially when it contradicts what God has planned for you, what God wants to work in your life. Because God's work in your life is an ongoing work. The old saying is, God loves us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us like we are. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, God began doing a good work in you, and I'm sure he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. Until the day that Jesus comes to take us to heaven, God is working in our lives. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's an ongoing building project. He is making us less and less like we were so that we can become more and more like him. God's plan for your life is to be more Christ-like, to be less like you and to be more like Jesus Christ. Romans 8 verse 29 from the New Living Translation, God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. There's an old story. Uh, a sculptor made a statue uh, of a horse and it was so lifelike that people marveled at it and they said how did you take that ugly piece of stone and make it look like a horse that's stunning the sculptor replied that was easy I simply chipped away everything from the stone that didn't look like a horse God is chipping away at our lives 
everything in our lives that doesn't look like Jesus. He's working in our lives and he's removing attitudes. Jesus says that God begins a pruning process in our lives, that when we get saved, we haven't arrived. We've begun and he's begun a good work in us uh, that he's going to complete. And it does involve chipping away those things uh, that detract, uh, that aren't like Jesus. You know, we're called the Potter's House and we didn't get that name from T.D. Jakes. We got it from the Bible well before T.D. Jakes even thought of it. And we got it from Jeremiah 18, verse 2 to 3. It says, Arise and go to the potter's house, and there I'll cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. This is a picture of what God is doing in lives. We are the clay in the hands of the potter. And your life is on the wheel, being molded and made, and God is doing a work. And it's not a three-day or a three-year or a, a three-anything else work. It is a lifelong work that God is doing in your life. In Jeremiah 29, we know the Scripture in verse 11, it says, God has a plan and a future for us. But a lot of times the reality is we're not ready for the plan. We're not at a place where God could do what he wants to do. There are things that need to be removed. There are necessary qualities that we perhaps do not have that need to be added. God is doing a work in us. So the question is, how does God work in us? And there are many ways and there are things that we could list. It's a whole different sermon, in fact, all the ways that God works in our lives. But here's two. Two things that God does uh, to work in our lives. The first or two things that God uses to work in our lives. And the first is circumstances. All the trials that we go through, the setbacks, the difficulties, the failures, as well as the victories, the betrayals, the disappointments. And our response to those many times is this is terrible. This is horrible. This is not the way it should be. And uh, it might not necessarily be what you planned, but it's not necessarily a bad thing either. I like good times. I enjoy good times. But I have to admit that I'm more transformed through tough times. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 3 says, Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. Isn't it true that we're most desperate for God in tough times? Isn't it true that circumstances of life, uh, when they're difficult and challenging, that's what brings out our desperation to get a hold of God? That's what really forges our faith and we, we begin to make decisions about what we believe? Isn't it in times of adversity and persecution even that we just determine that we live for God, we're going to serve God, we make heaven our home? Circumstances are uh, one of the key tools that God uses to do a work in our lives. And if you'll let it, if you allow the circumstances of life to do God's work in you, all things can work together for good. The second thing that God uses to do a work in our lives is people. God uses other people to do a work in us. Now, when this era of online church is over, God wants us to be in church. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to be back in church with real people together with you. But the reality is there are some people thinking, you know what, <laughs> I'm enjoying being online. Wish we could stay online forever. And I can understand where that would come from this evening, but the truth is you need people. You need people to do, uh, because people bring out something in us that without them it will just never be there. It would never be developed in our lives. And uh, there are people that think, well, you know what, that's fine, but people really bug me. I'm just not a people person. People really get on my nerves. That's exactly the point. People reveal the real us. Pastor Greg Mitchell says, if you think you're a wonderful person, get married. Because in that marriage situation, you begin to discover you're not so wonderful. And if you think you are, you have a, a, a partner that's going to point out, well, you're not exactly quite that wonderful. There are some people that were in quarantine well before coronavirus struck. They'd quarantined themselves from people. They'd removed themselves from the influence of others. And the Bible says iron, like iron sharpens iron. So the countenance of a friend or brother sharpens his brother. We sharpen one another. That involves sometimes friction. That involves 
perhaps sometimes some unpleasantness, some situations where we have to work through. People are not like us. We are all different. We have different personality traits. We have issues. Uh, we are working through things. People are working through things at different speeds. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, they're at different levels. And it's in the process of that together it brings out the best in us. God uses circumstances. God uses people to do a work in us. He's got a plan for your life. But we're not ready for that plan at the, mo- at the point of salvation. He is doing a work in us to get to that place. As they cleaned away the grime and the pollution from Michelangelo's painting on the Sistine Chapel, they, dis- they made an amazing discovery. And that is that the paintings were far more vivid and colourful and beautiful than they'd ever imagined. All those years of, of soot and grime had given them kind of a dark look and people had accepted that's what he painted. But as they cleaned it, they saw he had a completely different painting in mind, something far more beautiful something far more stunning. That's God doing a work in you. As he's working the grime and the grot away, it's to bring out something better in your life. There's a third point this evening, and that is that God's people at work. See, the logic of the text is uh, that we are saved by grace, grace alone. The emphasis is on grace, not of works. Verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I mean, it's very clear. Paul has been very, very clear that it's God's mercy, God's grace, and it's not conditional. It's unconditional. But then in the very next verse, in verse 10, he says, but God's people should work. It's like, Paul, are you schizophrenic? You said we were saved by grace and now you're saying we should work? It's true this evening that salvation is by grace. Absolutely. Absolutely beyond doubt. By grace alone. And there's nothing that our works can do to add to our salvation. But you cannot deny from the text that we were created for a purpose and there is a work to do. And our works are the proofs that we've been saved. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 17 to 20. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. We are not saved by works, but If there are no works subsequent to salvation, we have grounds to doubt you are generally or genuinely even saved. James 2 verses 17 to 18. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. It's the fruit. It's the outflow of a Christian life is that there would be good works. Our good works do not earn any special kind of more love from God or any special kind of like place in his heart. We already have that because we're his creation, because he loves us unconditionally. But we are created for good works. That an outflow of being saved is that we'd want to do something for God. There's two aspects of good works. What does it mean, the good works that he's talking about? Well, I believe this this evening that a saved person wants to work for God out of gratitude. Not to earn God's love, but out of a gratitude for God's love. I didn't work to get this in any way, but now that I'm saved, what can I do to demonstrate my gratitude? Luke 7, verse 37 to 38, And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears and then wipe them with the hair of her head. She kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Here is a woman that totally didn't deserve to be loved by God. She'd lived a life in rebellion, in sin, but she'd been forgiven. And out of that forgiveness had flowed just gratitude. And out of that gratitude 
flowed this work of, of this this work of worship. She didn't deserve to be loved, but she's thinking, what can I do to say thank you? No, true believers want to do something for God. They want to give their finances to God. They want to be a witness for God. They want to serve in the church. They want to respond to the love that God has for them, not because they can earn God's favor or God's salvation. We've received that unconditionally. But because they're grateful. Having been saved by no works, now in gratitude, we want to say thank you by what we do. So God's or good works flow out of good uh, out of gratitude. The other thing about good works is that they flow to other people. In Genesis 12 verse 2, God says to Abram, I will bless you and you'll be a blessing. That God blesses us that we can bless someone else. 1 Timothy 6 verse 18 says, Rich people should be rich in good works. And then he defines it, be ready to give, be ready to share. The outflow of God's work in our life or God's love in our life is good works. And that when we do that, when we're, when we're actively good to people as a result of God's love in our lives, we become a good testimony to the unsaved. 1 Peter 2 verse 12, having your conduct honourable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. At the Alamo, they have a tribute to those who fought and died in the battle of the Alamo. And there's a series of portraits there of the people that fought and uh, you know, fought for freedom in that region. Near the entry, there's a painting with a plaque, James Butler Bonham. No picture of him exists, the plaque says. This portrait is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. What a picture of Jesus Christ and salvation. I've never seen Jesus, but I've seen people who personify or exemplify what he would look like by the way they live. The work he's done in their lives, their testimony, their willingness to share, to be involved in the things of God. God has worked for us. He's doing a work in us and he wants to work through us to reach others. I'm going to close this time in a word of prayer this evening. And First of all, if you're not a Christian, God wants to bring you to a place of forgiveness and salvation. He loves you unconditionally. He doesn't care about... Uh, the past, he doesn't care about failure. He just wants to forgive you and make heaven your home. And the Bible says that your sin has separated you from God, but Jesus died for your sin. He shed his blood to purchase your forgiveness so you can make heaven your home. If you want to receive Jesus Christ this evening, if you're willing to repent from a life of sin and give your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father God, I admit I'm a sinner. I repent. And I give my life to Jesus Christ. I make him my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me my sin. That Jesus died for me. He rose again from the dead. I believe it. I pray thank you for giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, if you've recently received Jesus Christ, you want to know more about serving God, our contact details are in the description below. We'd love to help you this evening. Let me challenge Christians this evening. God is at work. You are a work of God. There is nothing you can do to somehow earn God's favor or earn God's love because he already loves you. You're his valued treasure. There are some of you, you wrestle so hard because of past failure and sin and shortcoming. And you think that God is really up in the air about you and that he could change his opinion about you at any time that your position in the kingdom is, is, is in peril. That's not the case. You're his special treasure and you're loved of God. Having said that, he's continuing to do a work in you. Philippians 1 verse 6 says that he's going to continue to do that work to the day of Jesus Christ. And it's our job to cooperate with the work that God is doing in our lives. He's going to use circumstances. He's going to use people. You need to recognize that and, be, uh, and allow God to have his way in your life. That he can bring out the very best in you, the person that you were created to be. That you might, you might fulfill the plan that he has for your life. 
And finally, this evening, there's the idea that God wants to work through you, that there's a job for you to do, our, our text says. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be a blessing to others? Not because you can somehow earn salvation or because your salvation's at stake, but because you're grateful. Because you're just grateful. And it's not just a, a feeling of gratitude, but it's action towards others. And it's a testimony that can lead them to salvation. I pray that God would challenge you about these things and help you this evening, not just to live in condem not to, to not live in condemnation, but also to, to live a, a productive and fruitful Christian life, to do all that God wants you to do. God bless you this evening. Be a part of men's discipleship men tomorrow evening. See you again on Wednesday. Looking forward to catching up by the Zoom meeting. God bless you.